Hello. Here we are for some more of Terry Pratchett's I Shall Wear Midnight, book four of the Tiffany Aiken series. If you didn't realise that this was book four, oh my goodness, there's three others before this. Yeah, and another one after it. But that means you do need to go back to my playlists and have a listen to the other three books probably first before you listen to this one. We're up to chapter six now in this one, so you'll have missed quite a lot. So go to my playlists and find the We Free Men. Start there. All right, won't take you long, just a couple of days. <laughs> anyway, here we go. Chapter six, The Coming of the Cunning Man. Tiffany was angry at herself for oversleeping. Her mother actually had to bring her up a cup of tea. But the Kelder had been right. She hadn't been sleeping properly and the ancient but homely bed had just closed around her. Still, it could have been worse, she told herself as they set off. For example, there could have been snakes on the broomstick. The Feagles had been only too glad, as Rob anybody to put it, to feel the wind beneath the Celts. Feagles were probably better than snakes but that was only a guess they would do things like run from one side of the stick to the other to look at interesting things that they were flying over and on one occasion she glanced over her shoulder to see about 10 of them hanging onto the back of the stick or to put it more precisely one of them was hanging onto the back of the stick and then one was hanging onto his heels and one was hanging onto his heels and so on and so forth all the way to the last feagle they were having fun, screaming with laughter, their kilts indeed flapping in the wind. Presumably the thrill of it made up for the danger and the lack of a view, or at least of a view that anyone else would want to look at. One or two actually did lose their grip on the bristles, floating away and down while waving at their brothers and making yahoo noises and generally treating it as a big game. Feagles tended to bounce when they hit the ground, although sometimes they damaged it a little bit. Tiffany wasn't worried about their journey home. Undoubtedly, there would be lots of dangerous creatures prepared to jump out on a little running man. But by the time he got home, there would be, in fact, considerably fewer of them. Actually, the Feagles were, by Feagle standards, pretty well behaved on the flight and didn't actually set fire to the broomstick until they were about 20 miles from the city, an incident heralded by Daft Woolley saying, Oops very quietly and then guiltily trying to conceal the fact that he'd set fire to the bristles by standing in front of the blaze to hide it. You've set the broomstick on fire again, haven't you, Woolly? Tiffany stated firmly. What was it that we learned last time? We do not light fires on broomsticks for no good reason. The broomstick began to shake as Daft Woolly and his brothers tried to stamp out the flames. Tiffany searched the landscape below for below them for something soft and preferably wet to land on. It was no use getting angry with Woolly. He lived in a woolly-shaped world of his own. You had to try and think diagonally. I just wonder, daft Woolly, she said as the broomstick developed a nasty rattle, if working together we might find out why my broomstick is on fire. Do you think it might be something to do with the fact that you are holding a match in your hand? The Feagle looked at the match as if he'd never seen one before and then put it behind his back and stared at his feet, which was quite brave of him in the circumstances. I don't really know, miss. You see, said Tiffany as the wind whipped around them, without enough bristles I can't steer very well and we are losing height but still regrettably going quite fast. Perhaps you could help me with this conundrum, will he? Daft Woolly stuck his finger in his ear and wiggled it about as if rummaging in his own brain. Then he brightened up. Should we not land, miss? Tiffany sighed. I would like to do that, Daft Woolly, but you see, we are going quite fast and the ground is not. What we have in those circumstances is what they call a crash. I wasn't considering that you should land in the dirt, miss, said Woolly. He pointed down and added, I was just considering... You might like to land on that. Tiffany followed the line of his pointing finger. There was a long white road below them and on it, not too far ahead, was something oblong moving along as fast as the broomstick itself. She stared, listening to her brain calculating and said, We will still have to lose some speed. And that was how a smouldering broomstick carrying one terrified witch and about two dozen of the Nakmak Feagles, holding their kilts out to slow themselves down, landed on the roof of the Lankrata Ankh Morpork 
Parcel Express. The coach had good springs and the driver got the horses back under control quite quickly. There was silence as he climbed down from his seat while white dust began to settle on the road. He was a heavy looking man who winced at every step and in one hand he held a half eaten cheese sandwich and in the other an unmistakable length of lead pipe. He sniffed. My supervisor will have to be told. Damage to paintwork, you see that? Got to do a report when it's damage to paintwork. I hates reports. Never been a main what words we come to with ease. Got to do it though, ain't I? When it's damage to paintwork. The sandwich, and more importantly the lead pipe, disappeared back into his very large overcoat and Tiffany was amazed at how happy she felt about that. I really am very sorry, she said as the man helped her down from the coach roof. It's not me, you understand, it's the paintwork. I tell them, look, I tell them there's no, I tell them there's trolls, there's dwarfs, eh? And you know they, how they drive, eyes half closed most of the time because of them not liking the sun. Tiffany sat still as he inspected the damage and then looked up at her and noticed the pointy hat. Oh, he said, a witch. First time for everything, I suppose. Do you know what I'm carrying in here, miss? What could be the worst thing, Tiffany thought. She said, is it eggs? Ha, ah, said the man. I should be so lucky. It's mirrors, miss. One mirror, in point of fact. Not a flat one either. It's a ball, they tell me. It's all packed up very snug and sound. So as they say, anyway, not knowing that somebody was going to drop out of the sky onto it. He didn't sound angry, just worn out, as if he permanently expected the world to hand him the dirty end of the stick. It was made by the dwarfs, he added. They say it costs more than a thousand ink milk pork dollars. Do you know what it's for? to hang up in a dance hall in the city where they intend to dance the waltz which a well brought up young lady such as you should not know about on account of the fact it says in the paper that it leads to depravity and goings on my word said tiffany thinking that something like this was expected of her well i suppose i better go and see what the damage is said the driver laboriously opening the back of the coach a large box filled quite a lot of the space it's mostly packed with straw, he said. Give me a hand to get it down, will you? And if it tinkles, I'd say we were both in trouble. It turned out not to be as heavy as Tiffany expected. Nevertheless, they lowered it gently onto the road and the coachman rummaged among the straw inside, bringing out the mirror ball, holding it aloft like a rare jewel, which indeed it resembled. It filled the world with sparkling light, dazzling the eyes and sending beams of flashing rays across the landscape. And at this point the man screamed in pain and dropped the ball which shattered into a million pieces, filling the sky just for a moment with a million images of Tiffany, while he, curling up, landed on a rose, raising more white dust and making little whimpering noises as the glass dropped around him. In slightly less than an instant, the moaning man was surrounded by a ring of feagles armed to whatever teeth they still possessed with claymores, more claymores, bludgeons, axes, clubs and at least one more claymore. Tiffany had no idea where they'd been hiding. A feagle could hide behind a hair. Don't hurt him, she shouted. He wasn't going to hurt me, he's very ill. But make yourselves useful and tidy up all this broken glass, please. She crouched down in a road and held the man's hand. How long have you been jumping bones, sir? Oh, I've been a martyr to them these past twenty years, miss, a martyr, the coachman moaned. It's the jolting of the coach, you see. It's the spenders. They don't work. I don't think I get more than just one decent night's sleep in five, miss. And that's the truth, miss. I have a little snooze, turn over like you do, and there's this little click and then it's agony, believe me. Except for a few dots on the edge of sight, there was no one else around apart from, of course, for a bunch of knack-knack feagles who, against all common sense, had perfected the art of hiding behind one another. Well, I think I might be able to help you, Tiffany said. Some witches used a shamble to see into the present, and with any luck, into the future as well. In the smoky gloom of the feagal mound, the Kelder was practising what she called the hidlins the things he did and passed on, but on the whole passed them on as a secret. And she was acutely aware of Amber watching her with clear interest. A strange child, she thought. She sees, she hears, she understands. What would we give for a world full of people like her? She had set up the cauldron and lit a small fire underneath the leather. The Kelder closed her eyes, concentrated and read the memories of all the Kelders who had ever been and ever would be. 
Millions of voices floated through her brain in no particular order, sometimes soft, never very loud, often tantalisingly beyond her reach. It was a wonderful library of information, except that all of the books were out of order and so were all of the pages. There wasn't, there wasn't an index anywhere. She had to follow threads that faded as she listened. She strained as small sounds, tiny glimpses, stifled cries, currents of meaning pulled her attention this way and that. And there it was, in front of her as if it had always been there, coming into focus. She opened her eyes, stared at the ceiling for a moment and said, I look for the big wee hag, and what is it that I see? She peered forward into the mists of memories, old and new, and jerked her head back, nearly knocking over Amber, who said with interest, A man with no eyes. Mm -hmm. A man with no eyes. Who could this be? Could it be who the title of the chapter is named after? The Cunning Man? Who knows? I'm sure we'll find out soon. Now, before you go, I've got a question for you. Something that someone raised in a comment the other day. Unbeknownst to me, YouTube have put adverts in my videos now. Is everybody getting these adverts? I haven't I haven't switched anything on. I think, looking and reading stuff, because I tried to frantically find out how to stop the adverts, you only get like the um the monetization of it when you get a thousand subscribers i haven't got a thousand subscribers so i should i'm not being paid for it or anything i'm not putting the adverts on to get money which i know some youtubers do that but um yeah i haven't switched anything on to make adverts come up and it kind of does as this person rightly said in their comment if I'm reading you a bedtime story and it's supposed to be all relaxing and all of a sudden, Granny, I got the job, suddenly appears in the middle of it. It spoils everything. So I've got two questions. First one, is everybody getting the adverts? I, I tried watching a couple of my videos and I didn't get the adverts. But are you getting the adverts in yours? Please, can you let me know in a comment? Second question to you, as you know, Mr. S does a story but Mr. S does not do technology. <laughs> How do I switch them off? Is there a way that I, if I can't switch them off, I can just put them at the beginning or a way that I can just put them at the end? I don't want to have adverts slap bang in the middle of my videos. That ruins the whole point of my videos, doesn't it? And I'm really sorry if you're drifting off and all of a sudden you get an advert. I didn't intend that to happen, and I like like I said, I haven't switched anything. I wouldn't know how to switch anything. But if someone could help me out, do you get the adverts? And how do I move the adverts, or how do I get rid of the adverts? I'd be really appreciative. Just put a little comment in the box down below, won't you? Thank you. I really like that. Thanks. What a team we are. What a f what a family. <laughs> All right. Okay, have a lovely evening. Super hot here again. I've just got home from work. It is 20 to 6 here in the UK. Look, you can see it's lovely out there today. Woo! Lush. All right, okay, I'll see you tomorrow. Night.